Welcome to a beginner's guide to dragonflies and damselflies. My name is James. I'm a learning and engagement officer with Sussex Wildlife Trust. And once again, I'm going to be your guide today. So welcome to part two. Today, we're going to be looking at some of the key differences between the dragonflies and damselflies, uh, just how to tell them apart, and also some of the main family groupings. So you're out in the field and you've seen an insect and you're fairly sure it's a dragonfly or a damselfly. But just how do you tell the difference between the two groups? Well, fortunately, they both have some, some key features that will enable you to do this. So in the case of the dragonflies, uh, as I mentioned in part one, they belong to the Anisoptera or unequal wings. So when they're resting, they often tend to hold the wings out at right angles from the body. And if you look at the hind wing, the lower wing in this picture, you can see that it's actually shorter but wider than the front wing. Now, their bodies as a whole, they're, they're much more heavily built and larger than the damselflies. So they tend to have a rather sort of robust, somewhat stocky appearance. Now, their eyes, as a general rule, almost always meet in the middle. Now, of course, in nature, there are always exceptions to the rule, and in the case of the common club tail, their eyes are actually spaced fairly widely apart. Now, perhaps the most distinctive characteristic about dragonflies is their flight. It is so incredibly distinctive. Now, of course, they're very powerful flyers, and they often tend to incorporate a lot of hovering into their flight, although this is rather dependent on the species. Now, when you see them, they're often going to be whizzing around very, very quickly. And actually, their stance is somewhat reminiscent of an attack helicopter. Uh, they really are fascinating to watch. So damselflies have their own defining characteristics. Belonging to the suborder Zygoptera, their wings are equal. So looking at their front and hind wings, you'll see that they're very, very similar in both size and shape. Now you'll often find with damselflies that they tend to hold their wings together along the body. Now this is because they're hinged, which is different from the dragonflies that don't have this hinging and are therefore not able to hold their wings in the same manner. Now damselflies, they're, they're very different in look because they have a real delicacy to them. Uh, they're much smaller, they're much thinner, they look more fragile as a whole, and they're certainly a lot more dainty in appearance. In fact, there's even a damselfly called the dainty damselfly, which very much typifies this look. Now, in contrast to the dragonflies, the eyes of all of our British damselfly species don't meet in the middle. So they really do epitomize the phrase bug-eyed. Now, of course, the flight is also dramatically different from the dragonflies. As a whole, it's very, very weak. Some of the damselflies tend to be a little bit fluttery, a little bit butterfly-like, uh, but the majority, to be honest with you, they're reminiscent of a flying matchstick. Now, I know that sounds a bit ridiculous, but genuinely, most are a similar size to a matchstick, and therefore, that is a really good analogy uh, for thinking about what they may look like. They also tend to stick very close to vegetation or water, and you won't tend to see them flying right out in the open in quite the same manner as the dragonflies. Now, fortunately, the dragonflies and damselflies can be split into some rather defined groups. Uh, and actually, the, the naming of the groups is really logical because it tends to be determined by either colour or sizing or perhaps the habits of individual species. So the first group that we're going to look at are the so-called larger species. Uh, now, there are 12 species in this group, uh, of which eight of those are classified as hawker dragonflies. So it's mainly the emperors and the hawkers that make up this group. Now, these dragonflies, they quite literally hawk for their prey. So they pursue and they catch their prey in the air. Now, I have to say that this group is going to frustrate you like no other uh, and that is because these dragonflies are so active. They're all really powerful. They're really, really good flyers. And they very rarely tend to come to rest. Now, I have to be honest, you are probably going to need the patience of a saint 
to wait for this to happen in order to get a better look at one of them. But they are all very big and very beautiful, so it's well worth it. Now, the next group we're gonna look at are the so-called emerald dragonflies. So they all display this beautiful metallic emerald coloration, uh, but I have to say the three species in the group, they're all very localized in their distribution, so perhaps not that commonly seen. Now, the next group we're gonna look at are the club tails. Now, I should really say club tail because there is in fact only one species in this group, and that is the rather magnificent common club tail as pictured here. Now, I'm sure I probably don't need to explain as to why this dragonfly is known as the club tail. So the next group are the chaser dragonflies. So we have three bit British species of chaser dragonfly. They're all medium sized and they have this very distinctive pointed tapering abdomen. Now they really do live up to their name because they love a prominent perch and you'll often see them flying out from this perch, chasing away intruders, chasing prey uh, or chasing females in the case of the males. Now the next group are the skimmer dragonflies and you may well ask, well, what are the differences between the skimmers and the chasers? Because they do look quite similar. And you're absolutely right. They also have these very distinctive pointed abdomens. Now we just have the two species of skimmer in Britain, but different from the chasers, the skimmers tend to perch largely on the ground or very close to the ground and you'll often see them skimming low over the water. Now the last group we're gonna look at are the darter dragonflies. So we have the six species of darter in the UK, but in truth, only two of them are relatively common and widespread. Now in much the same manner as the skimmers and the chasers, these are also a dragonfly that live up to their name. So again, they love a prominent perch, uh, often on the ground or close to the ground. And what they'll do is they'll dart out uh, to pursue their prey and then return to the same perch. Now, they're also not a particularly shy group. And you will find that if you're very, very careful and quiet, you'll often be able to approach these dragonflies very, very closely. Okay, everybody, well, that's it for the dragonflies. So now we're gonna move on to the damselflies. Now, fortunately, the damselflies can also be split into the six groups, just like the dragonflies, which helps to keep things quite simple. Now, the first group we're gonna look at are the demoiselles, the beautiful demoiselles. They have this startling, iridescent coloration, absolutely stunning. They're also very fluttery, very butterfly-like in their flight characteristics, and they have a really, really unique character trait, and that is that they're the only UK damselflies to have coloured wings. So just the two species of demoiselle in Britain. Now the next group we're going to look at, in line with the dragonflies, are also known as the emeralds. Now, of course, they're very, very different from the emerald dragonflies, uh, but they do also display this lovely metallic green coloration. Now we have just the four species of emerald damselfly in the UK, but there's only really one species that is relatively common and widespread. The third grouping is undoubtedly the toughest group of damselflies to get to grips with, the blue damselflies. Now, they may be simple in name, but they're certainly not that simple in terms of identification. These are likely to pose you the biggest identification conundrum of any of the damselfly groups. So blue damselflies occupy eight of the 20 species of damselfly in the UK. Now, sticking with the blue theme, we also have two species of blue-tailed damselfly. Now, one of these two species is actually one of the very commonest damselflies in the UK and is definitely likely to be one of those that you will have encountered before. Now, sticking with the colour theme, uh, we also have the red damselflies. Now, we just have the two red damselflies in the UK 
and in much the same manner as the blue-tailed, one of the red damselfly species is also incredibly abundant, one of our very commonest species. Now the last grouping we're going to talk about are the red-eyed damselflies. Now the eagle-eyed amongst you may have noticed that the previous red damselfly also had red eyes. Now you are absolutely correct, but for the purposes of this red-eyed group, these ones actually have a different body colour to the coloration of their eyes. Just the two species of these in the UK as well. Okay everybody, well now that we've looked at the groups of dragonflies and damselflies, we're gonna move on to look at some of the key identification features to try and help you understand just what it is that you're looking at. Now perhaps one of the first things to keep an eye out for is in fact the color of the eyes. Uh, or maybe even the colour and patterning on the front of the face. Now, I would say this isn't necessarily an imperative feature to look out for, uh, but it may assist you in some cases. Now, something that is perhaps a little bit more important is to look at the thorax of the dragonfly. So this is where the wings are attached. Now, actually, what you want to do is look at the colour and the extent of the colour on the side of the thorax. So you can see in the example of this beautiful male southern hawker, he has these lovely green stripes, which are really, really diagnostic. In fact, this feature varies enormously from species to species, and it is something that you may even be able to see in flight, uh, although you do have to hope that the dragonfly flies quite slowly. Now, as well as looking at the side of the thorax, you also want to look at the top because the stripes on top of the thorax are really, really important. In fact, this is one of the best features for trying to work out what species it is that you're looking at. So in the case of this southern hawker, you can see it has these two big green blotches on top, and they're really very, very distinctive. So some species actually may display almost no stripes whatsoever. Moving away from the thorax, we're gonna move on to the abdomen. So if you can, it's also very important to try and get a look at certain parts of the abdomen. Now, dragonflies and damselflies have 10 segments overall, and the segment we're looking at in the red circle is the second segment. So you can see in this southern hawker, it has this little green triangle that's pointing all the way to the tail, but this will differ from species to species. Now, if you look all the way along the abdomen, you'll see that this dragonfly has these paired dots, but the paired dots actually become banded at the end of the abdomen. Again, this is a really important trait of Southern Hawker, and it is something that will help you to differentiate one species from another. Moving away from the abdomen, we're gonna move on to the wings and the color of the wing spots. Now on each wing, a dragonfly will display a wing spot known as the pterostigma, and the color of these is variable. Now, the one thing I would say is that if the light happens to be shining through the dragonfly's wings, it may slightly change the appearance of the wing spots, so do bear that in mind. Now, as well as the wing spots, try and take note of the front wing vein on the wings. Now, this is known as the costa, and the coloration of the costa can be really diagnostic for the recognition of individual species. Okay, so you may be thinking, well, all this is very well, but how on earth am I gonna look at any of these features when the dragonfly simply will not stop flying? It's a valid point, and to be honest, the only advice I can offer is to be patient. Now, of course, some dragonfly species are prolific perchers and you're likely to get a good look at them. Some not so much, but all I can say is they will eventually perch and you really just have to keep your fingers crossed that they happen to perch close to where you're standing. Okay folks, so we're just gonna move on to some key identification features of our damselflies. Now it is worth noting that lots of these really are shared characteristics along with the dragonflies. To that end, it is again well worth looking at the color of the eyes. This can be a really useful feature in damselflies, perhaps even more so than in dragonflies. Now, it's also worth looking at the markings between the eyes. 
So in the case of this blue azure damselfly on the right, you can see it has these really distinct blotches between the eyes. Now you may find on some species that they have additional markings between these markings. So in essence, you can end up with markings between markings between the eyes, which actually sounds more complex than it is. Now, of course, similar to dragonflies, looking at the thorax is once again really important. In this case, it's really the colour and the thickness of the shoulder stripes, also known as the antihumeral stripes. Now, in the case of this azure damselfly, you can see that the blue stripes are substantially thinner than the black stripes that surround them. Now, sticking to the thorax, it's also worth noting as to whether the damselfly has this little spur on the side below the shoulder stripes. This is a really pivotal identification feature, but I'm going to be honest with you, everybody, this can be really hard to see. And the reason for that is because so many of our damselflies are just so small. So really, you're going to need to have your head pretty close to the damselfly to see this. Now, moving away from the thorax and onto the abdomen, segment two is once again really, really important. So the markings on this segment, they will vary enormously from species to species, and they really will help you to ascertain what it is you're looking at. Once again, moving along to the end of the abdomen, trying to take note as to what the coloration and whether there are any particular markings will be really, really beneficial. Now, of course, as with the dragonflies, the color of the wing spots, the pterostigma, is once again really, really useful. Uh, with damselflies, sometimes the shape of the pterostigma can also help because some are more elongated than others. Now, the last thing I would say is to perhaps have a look at the legs and see if they're plain or whether they're obviously striped. This can also be a really, really useful feature. Now, I probably should say that there are also some other features that you can look out for on dragonflies and damselflies, but I think that perhaps may be a little bit too much just for this presentation. Now, of course, the damselflies are incredibly small, and sometimes it's going to be so difficult to look out for any of these individual features. Perhaps the best advice I can give is to either look through a pair of binoculars or even better, take a photo with your digital camera and zoom in and have a look in close up. That will really, really help. OK, folks, well, that concludes part two to a beginner's guide to dragonflies and damselflies. And join me again in part three, where we'll be looking at some of the commoner dragonfly species that you can find in Sussex.